Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. As Yemen is pulverized into oblivion, it remains unclear just exactly what Riyadh hopes to achieve in this war. Washington has tied itself to this conflict, but can't control or explain it. Soon, there won't be much of Yemen left to make peace with. To crosstalk the war in Yemen, I'm joined by my guest, Hillary Leverett in Washington. She is a visiting scholar at Georgetown University and co-author of the book, Going to Tehran, Why America Must Accept the Islamic Republic of Iran. Also in Washington, we have Sama Alhamdani. She is an independent Yemen analyst and writer. And in London, we cross to David Hurst. He is the editor-in-chief of Middle East Eye. All right, crosstalk rules. In fact, that means you can jump in anytime you want. I very much appreciate it. Hillary, if I go to you first, can you explain this conversation? Conflict for me, for me, because I certainly don't get it at all. The the good guys are being attacked by these bad guys. <laughs> the bad guys are really rich. The the good guys are really poor. And then you have Al Qaeda of the uh, Arabian Peninsula grabbing up half the country, and nobody seems to be bothering them very much. Yeah, I, mean, I think this can largely be explained in terms of Saudi Arabia reeling since the uh, 2011 Arab Awakening. Pursuing disastrous policy after disastrous policy, overthrowing, helping to overthrow the government in Libya, trying to overthrow the government in Syria, trying to impose a military dictatorship in Egypt, and now in Yemen. I think what we're seeing is this product of Saudi disorientation and and terror at a region that could become more representative in terms of its governance, more independent in terms of its foreign policy. And the Saudis are trying to prevent that kind of independence in foreign policy from emerging in Yemen. And they have yet again gone with the United States down this road to a, a, a war that has no end. And it's a disaster both, I think, for the Saudis and certainly for the Americans. Okay, David, if I go to you in London, I mean, a war without end, I agree with that. But what's the purpose of the war in the first place here? Because I can't see what they want to achieve. Does Saudi Arabia, with American help, want to occupy this entire country? Because that seems to be the only thing that they'll be able to do to get the outcome that they want. And that means compliance in Yemen. But that seems like a pretty bad bet to make, considering what we just heard from Hillary. Well, I think what they want to do is reinstall uh, the president, Hadi, uh, 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 who, who, who is now in exile and who's a pretty weak leader. He's no Winston Churchill. I mean, he basically fled as soon as the fighting started and his stock has gone down. Um, I think it's a really, really good question of, of what they actually want to achieve. Um, however, it's got to be said that the Houthis are no angels themselves and sure. they, they basically started a coup d'etat. And, um, and uh, they did it not uh, because of, a, of, of, of the revolution. They did it uh, in, in cahoots with uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was, uh, who was the guy who was the dictator that uh, the revolutionary forces tried to oust. That alone explains why the Houthis took so much ground so quickly. So it's a very, very complicated mess. What America wants to achieve out of this? I really don't know. Okay. Because as as we've <laughs> heard, they are they're, it's completely contradictory policies. Okay. That's right. so I want to go to Salma because that's exactly where I wanted to go. I mean, listening to the U.S. State Department and the Pentagon, I mean, it's it would be really hilarious. It's like the Daily Show. It would be comedy, but it's not comedy. They don't have they don't can't really explain what the United States is doing in supporting the Saudis in Yemen. They don't know how to do it. Well, first of all, I want to say that this is not a bad guy versus good guy situation. It's a lot more complex than that. And I think David made a good point of explaining that everybody on the ground has something to benefit. Having said that, the U.S.'s role here is to show support to Saudi Arabia. I think uh, given the nuclear talks that are taking place with Iran now, I think Saudi Arabia feels that the U.S. is probably not backing them up up as much as they want them to. And so the U.S. just sent ships to uh, Yemen to receive uh, planes to protect the coast of Yemen and to block and intercede any shipments that are coming from Iran. And this is all just to show support to Saudi Arabia. Uh, the idea that Iran would do that is still far-fetched, mm. given that they want to sign the nuclear talks at the end of June. 
Okay, Sam, if I can stay with so you, I mean, it's, I, it's I, a mess. I, 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 I want to that. point out to our, li our viewers right here is that yes, a the Americans are going to be helping with a blockade, a blockading of a country that imports almost all of its food, almost 90% of its food, and, and, the, and now a blockade is going to be put in force here. You know, okay, I can agree that there's a lot of bad with a lot of people down there. Uh, um, uh, having them face starvation is not something the U.S. government or any, anyone else should be involved in. Go ahead, Hillary, you want to jump in? Go ahead. Yeah, I think I agree with my colleague that there is a, a coincidence in terms of the, the ongoing talks with Iran over the nuclear issue. But this collaboration between Washington and Riyadh certainly predates that. Washington and Riyadh collaborated to overthrow the government of Libya and to destroy that country before there were any kind of uh, constructive nuclear talks with Iran. And of course, this policy go dates back to 1979 when Washington and Riyadh collaborated to arm, fund, and train. Saudis and Afghans and others to goad the Soviet Union into invading Afghanistan and then to have uh, to bring the Soviet Union into a Vietnam like quagmire there. Unfortunately, this time around, I think the Saudis and the United States met have, may have met their match in Yemen and the Saudis may see their own Vietnam in Yemen. David, again, this yeah, I, is, think, I, I wanted to I go think with that's this. Because right. Do you think that, that, again, essentially a regional war here where we're going to find that Yemen is the proxy? Absolutely. It, it is a proxy war. And I'd like to add just one more complicating detail. And that is that the previous Saudi regime under Abdullah and a coterie of extremely dubious advisers who are absolutely into the business of backing dictators against democratic uprisings initially started the contacts with the Houthis. Bandar, Prince Bandar, who was the former intelligence chief, and you all know in Washington as Bandar Bush, was one of the guys who actually flew a uh, 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 leading Houthi via London uh, to, to Riyadh to start uh, what was a rolling coup. Now, what was this about? This was not about taking over the whole of Yemen. The original project, as I understand it, was to target ISLA, which is the sort of Yemeni equivalent of the Muslim Brotherhood. That's what they were interested in. And this plan went completely out of control because the Houthis took much more ground than was actually calculated. So now you've got a complete change of regime in, in, in Saudi Arabia. You've got a new bunch of guys there who were themselves targeted uh, in, in, in the succession by the previous group. And they're saying, they're saying mayhem on their border. Now, there is an argument, and I'm absolutely no spokesman for the Saudis, that if they had done nothing, this is the argument in Riyadh, it's not one I share, but if they'd done nothing, what you would have had was uh, Iranian-backed Houthis. Mm. Again, this has to be qualified as, as to, to what extent they are physically backed by either Hezbollah or Iran versus al-Qaeda. If they hadn't uh, gone in, who would have supported the Sunnis? That's, their, that's the argument. I think this is a completely self-serving argument, but that's what they were saying. Okay. But there was chaos before and chaos well, now. Okay, Sam, I, 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 if to follow up on what David had to say, I mean, whatever the level of uh, involvement Iran uh, has in all of this, uh, the, the way things are going, its involvement will only increase. Uh, not that it was there in the beginning, but it could end up being uh, Ira um, Saudi Arabia's worst nightmare by actually bringing in the, uh, the Iranians instead of uh, uh, pushing them off. Um, I, again, I don't think that the Iranians would get involved in this, yeah. but I, I do want to say that the Houthis themselves are no angels. In the south of Yemen, specifically in Aden al Dala and areas around that, the Houthis have led massacres ever since these airstrikes begun. So you have half the population strongly supporting this, these Saudi airstrikes on the ground. And that's because they're under the illusion that the Saudis are there to free them uh, from northern Houthi rule in their mind. Uh, having said that, the Houthis have made it very clear that they have no democratic agenda in mind. They have pushed from Sada into the capital, Sana'a, and have expanded to the south of Yemen uh, in the form of military intervention or militia on the ground fighting. And so it seems that they don't have uh, an economic agenda, a political agenda of any sort. Abdel Malik al Houthi, the leader of the movement, gave a speech over the weekend. And in his speech, he said that his legitimacy is given to him through the Qur'an, so religious and divine legitimacy. Uh, this man was not going to lead Yemen into a more democratic country, and we have to be clear about that. Um, okay. Having said that, the Saudi airstrikes are not slowing them down. They're not actually achieving the goals that they want to achieve. And the only winner out of all of this, unfortunately, is al-Qaeda in the Arabian well, Peninsula, as they've gained control in the governorate of Hadramaut. 
And so they, they've expanded while this war was taking place. Okay, I'm glad you said that because, I mean, we, we can have a lot of different characters on the ground with different agendas. But what you said at the very end, I think, is absolutely true. Uh, Hillary, you know, the only winner in all of this is Al Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula. And I think it's quite obvious here why the United States wants to get involved in this. I agree with you. Saudi foreign policy is very erratic. They see Iran in every single corner. Maybe they are in a couple of corners, but they're not the pervasive threat to the region that. Uh, the Riyadh thinks. That, that, that's certainly correct. I mean, I think there are actually going to be two winners in Yemen, as we saw in other, in other arenas, for example, in Afghanistan. One is going to be al-Qaeda, and the other is going to be Iran, because even though people hate to hear this, a critical component of Iranian foreign policy is to work to support, not necessarily with weapons, but politically to support politically disenfranchised groups, whether that's, you know, whether that's groups in Afghanistan, whether that's groups in, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Palestine. They work to empower those groups to participate in political processes. At the end of the day, that means that the that Iran gains favor in those countries because it has supported the political empowerment of mar previously marginalized groups. So Iran is going to come out ahead, just as it has in Afghanistan, in Lebanon, in Iraq. They're going to come out ahead. And then the militant group, the terror group on, on the ground, is going to be al-Qaeda. And I think, like in Syria, we're going to be hoping and praying that al-Qaeda is actually the, the junior league to an Islamic State, ISIS type of even more radical, even more brutal group on the ground that the Sunnis, that the Sunnis look to because they have nothing else, because the United States, with Saudi Arabia, has undercut the the representative groups that represent that could represent Sunnis in a political process, like the Muslim Brotherhood, whether it's in Egypt or their uh, their colleagues in in Yemen, like the Isla. Okay, we're, I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Yemen. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. True, mind you, we're discussing the war in Yemen. Okay, I'd like to go back to Washington. Somehow, what does Washington get out of all of this? Because it, it, it's, it's again, it's very peculiar. They're backing up their Saudi allies. The, uh, the Saudis are very nervous, as Hillary pointed out in the start of the program. The Arab Spring has spooked them, and they seem to go down, going down this path of a very erratic foreign policy, as if they could do it on their own. Well, the more they try to do it on their own, the more they kind of screw up, and that's my opinion. So where do we go from here, and what does Washington really get out of this? Because it's been pointed out is that al-Qaeda of the uh, Arabian Peninsula is winning out in all of this, but the U.S. doesn't seem to want to have any interest in attacking them. Actually, uh, Saudi Arabia is not doing this on its own. Uh, they've created an alliance with nine other countries, and so this is a huge uh, display of arm flexing for the Sunni monarch monarchs of the Gulf states and their alliances. Uh, it seems that it's a strong display of Saudi Arabia's presence and power in the region. Um, and I think the U.S. here really wants to tell Saudi Arabia, we're here for you. When it comes to al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Americans look like they've dropped the ball, but over the weekend again, there was a drone strike somewhere in the governorate of Hadramaut that killed a very top figure from al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So while al-Qaeda on the ground has secured a pipeline in Hadramaut and has controlled uh, two airports so far, and now they've created a cover for themselves, so they have uh, a group in, in, in Yemen on the ground with a different name that's going to lobby for their interests with the local government. Um, so th their development is happening very, sh very quickly and very strongly. Uh, it seems that the U.S. is very worried about that, hence the drone strike. I don't know what they're planning to do as long as these airstrikes continue, because it could be very confusing on who's who mm. on the ground. Mm. And these airstrikes always target and kill civilians, which is very risky yeah. given everything. Yeah. I think the U.S. at the moment doesn't want to get involved in the war. Hey, well, it, okay, if I go to David... So, so they it, have it, to slow it, it down. Yeah, it seems like they're very much involved. They're always very much involved, and they always make mistakes, and they always regret it. In the end, we can go all the way back to the invasion of Iraq, when they think they have an idea, control of the situation, and it just it winds, uh, winds up being a control that is uncontrollable, and you get more and more of these groups. That's why I find it really quite incredible 
incredible that the Americans think that they can control what's happening in Yemen. David. Well, I don't think they were given much warning by the yeah. Saudis, or indeed the Egyptians weren't either. So the, the extent to which they're in control of what uh, Saudi Arabia does, uh, they can back it after it's been, uh, uh, after they launched it. But I don't think they're necessarily in control. They can advise, but they can't. And the other thing, of course, yeah. that, ha that happened it, it was that they actually cleared their special forces out of a very key air base, and those special forces were aimed at targeting uh, al-Qaeda. I don't, you know, uh, you can call it uh, offshore balancing, as some academics have done in, in, in Washington. You can also call it playing one side off the other. But I think American policy in the Middle East is in complete chaos. Um, cynically, you could say, does it matter? Uh, America's fine, uh, but the <laughs> Middle East is in flames. Does it matter to, does it matter to America? I think it does. Uh, and I think their support of dictatorship is absolutely appalling particularly the dictatorship that's going on in Egypt. Yeah, they appear to have absolutely no qualms of doing that. But, and I also think the Arab Spring is still continuing, bubbling away underneath the surface. But what's undoubtedly happened, and I think this is as a result of Syria, is that America's allies are taking their own decisions. They don't trust yeah. America to, 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 put, to even, even put, uh, follow up their own neocon agenda, and they're just going off on their own. So this is basically the tail wagging I th the dog. I, I, I think David has got to the crux of the whole thing here. That's Hillary, a critically I can see, important point. I think you're right. And, and I'm Absolutely. going to ask all of you, I'm going to ask all of you, uh, do you feel comfortable that Saudi Arabia is you know, a, a leading um, uh, like this in the region in the name of the United States and its alliance with the United States? I, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Hillary first. Well, you know, it, it's a critically important point. I think what we're seeing are the consequences of the decline of American power, of the relative decline of American power in the Middle East. That is critically important. What we see happening with Saudi Arabia is very much that they're acting on their own. They were counting on, I think, the ability to purchase troops from Egypt and Pakistan to enable their, their uh, invasion uh, yeah. in Yemen, which is not coming to fruition. But the, the, this, this enterprise, this, uh, in, this intervention, Saudi intervention in Yemen, is enormously popular in Saudi Arabia. If you look at the, the Twitter traffic in Saudi Arabia, look at some of the, pub, the uh, polling data that's available in Saudi Arabia. It's enormously popular, and it allows, with this new government in Saudi Arabia, with King Salman, them to shift from an enormously unpopular policy, where they were going against Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, or even against ISIS with the United States, that was very unpopular in Saudi Arabia. It allows this new king to pivot from that unpopular position to something that's enormously popular, a sectarian, something that they can frame as a sectarian conflict against what they call the infidel Shia. This is something that the United States should not want to be associated with. It clearly is against our interests. But we've been doing this with the Saudis going back to 1979 in Afghanistan that brought us al-Qaeda and, of course, the direct line to 9-11. Okay, so if I go back to you in Washington, could this all just blow up in the face of Riyadh? What are the chances of that happening in your mind? So the, there is a complexity that we haven't talked about much in this, uh, in this show, and that is that President Hadi officially requested from Saudi Arabia to come into Yemen and to restore him back to power. And that is really what Saudi Arabia is saying. And given the proximity of Saudi Arabia to Yemen, it's only logical that they're very interested in the politics there. Um, and so the problem here is that it is already blowing up in their face, in the sense that when they eliminate the Houthi and the powers of former President Saleh, if they do that at all, then the only ally on the ground that is uh, capable of carrying out military operations would have to be al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Having said that, that means that they're going to have to restore their relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood and other factions that includes Islah and maybe even the joint meeting parties to restore them back to power. Um, this is all, while it is framed as a sectarian conflict, it is about the Houthis and former President Saleh refusing to fall in line with the agreements of the Gulf Corporation Council. The Gulf Corporation Council allowed former President Saleh to stay in the country as long as he does not practice politics, but he could not help himself. <laughs> he had to go ahead and take out everybody that opposed him. And so, in a very weird way, this is a lesson to him well, to not go yeah, out of his way and, is, and stop obeying yeah. I, I think you know, what, what that's, was told. That's the operative Absolutely. word, this kind of weird. Song, this is very well, yeah. weird, OK? Yeah, David, like, you know, the, the, the issue of legitimacy here is brought up. I mean, you know, I, ne I don't think of, when I think of Saudi Arabia, I don't think of the word legitimacy. It's not the one that first comes to mind, particularly with the power, uh, uh, change, the changes of power in Yemen over the past few years. Uh, 
uh, an election with one candidate, their candidate, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead. I know. I mean, the biggest mistake I think that the revolution in, in, in Yemen made, Change Square made, was to accept this deal with the devil, basically, which was to allow Saleh uh, immunity from prosecution, to allow him to stay as the leader of Yemen's uh, uh, political party. And what uh, this, one of the subplots to this is his son, Ahmed, who is, was the head of the Republican Guard. He was also uh, the Yemeni ambassador to the Emiratis. He's one of the key men who was playing around with, with, with the charge or rise of the Houthis. And I think the, the original idea or one of the subplots was that he would end up in power. Um, and in fact, this is rather like the plot of Catch-22, you know, where mm. Milo Minderbinder is bombing his own uh, uh, air base because he's been paid a higher price by the Germans. Uh, the Saudis are bombing, in fact, the Republican Guard, who they, in fact, financed. So where you actually, if you see where the bombs are falling, in particular where a, bomb fell on a, uh, a big bomb fell on a depot uh, over the weekend, they're actually bombing the Yemeni army as well as the Houthis. So this is a completely wild and... Uh, 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 difficult scenario. I think it's all a question of time. I think if the Houthis were pushed back from at least Arden and uh, Sana, then the Saudis would say, fine, we've done what we want and we can stop and we can call for a ceasefire. There's some sort of uh, face-saving thing. If this war drags on, then absolutely, it doesn't just depend, it's not just a U-turn in terms of Islah, they would actually be arming Islah. And that would be a real U-turn in Saudi policy because as we've talked about before, the whole aim of this thing was to destroy Islam in the first place. So this is an amazing U-turn. It depends on time. And the Yemen is the suffering. I mean, America has always viewed Yemen as, as, as a counter-terrorist uh, 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 operation. <laughs> a template. And it's not viewed may, uh, may I, as may a I template. Jump in it's here, not please? viewed Yemen y y as starving and that there's a the complete lack of water. You know, this is one of the poorest countries in, on, on, on the world. So. Okay, Sama wants to jump in in Washington. Please do. That's the point of the program, dear. Go ahead. This is exactly what needs to be said on television channels, and that is the fact that Yemen has 26 million people, the majority of which do not belong to the faction, faction of the Houthis or former President Saleh or of the Saudi or allies of the Saudi airstrikes. And so it seems that the people are caught in the middle in this war and they are really suffering. And I think David started shedding light on that. And I want to say that they have no electricity, they have no water, they have no access to food. They can't even be a proper IDP because they can't even go from one area to the other because cars are not working at the moment. They don't even have gas to leave areas that are being targeted. A lot of the airstrikes in the north are being launched in residential areas without prior warning. In the south, it's plagued by street wars and there's a lot of blood. The hospitals are incapable of absorbing these people and they don't have electricity to keep people alive. And so the situation there is really bad. And we have to look at the humanitarian side of this, really. It's been three weeks. Now we're pushing on four weeks. And the world seems to be completely silent. The majority of the news outlets are only starting now to, to pick up and realize how grave and dangerous the situation okay. is there. And I think if we continue to be silent, this is a situation well, that we can all regret that's why in the we're, future. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this program. Hillary, I'm going to give you the last word on the program. 30 seconds. Go ahead. The world is in silence. The world is actually standing with the United States in the Security Council and with the Saudis to blockade Yemen. There's nothing, by definition, hopeless about Yemen. They need an immediate ceasefire. They need an immediate national dialogue, and all the stakeholders in the region should be involved. It's as simple as that. The United States, Saudi Arabia, and a lot of the world community are aiding and abetting the destruction of yet another Muslim country in the Middle East. Okay, on that very depressing note, many thanks to my guests in Washington and in London, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, cross top rules.